All right, guys. Let's follow this nice little trail my boys made for me so I can stay out of the deep snow and make our way to the birds. Ooh, it's cold out here. But we need to get these videos going. I think they're starting to become a little drug out or drawn out. And uh, we want to keep them going. I just fed the birds. I'm cleaning a little bit in the, around the loft. Not much you can do when it's so freaking cold. Give them a second. I think they're all done eating. Open it up slowly. Let them catch their breath here. All right, guys. Let's let's move on. Okay, so let me get these guys calmed down, or we won't be able to hear anything in the videos. Come on, guys. If you don't belong in here. Sorry about that guys, it's a little hectic, but if I don't put them in the right boxes, it's going to cause trouble and too much noise. And I need you, little darling, in the right box. Nope, one more, one more. There we go. Hopefully that's not too chaotic guys. Alright guys, we got them all calmed down. I believe everybody's in the right boxes. Everybody needs to get back on their eggs that are not on their eggs. So I can move on with the video. Now, one thing I want to point out before I start the video, and it's just something I noticed. I haven't been able to clean in here in probably, say, close to a week now. Um, I have scraped some of the heavy stuff off on the warmer days, but I really haven't been able to get in here and scrape very heavily. And one thing that I noticed is you notice how some boxes are just clean? For instance, this box here, very little debris compared to this box. And then in the bottom box again, very little debris, droppings. You move over to Gingerbread Man. He's sort of heavy. I don't think it means anything. I just thought it was kind of weird how some birds just choose to sort of just defecate right in their box while others will move away from their box to defecate. I don't mind it because, again, I can see the quality. I can see the droppings are nice and tight, so it's kind of a good parameter to see the bird's condition. I just found it kind of weird how some birds won't, won't crap in their box. Very strange. Nonetheless, guys, let's move on. Pair number 11. Pair number 11. You beautiful pair. This pair here is, uh, is not my own. And what I mean by that, they are my pigeons. I own them. Uh, but they're not part of my three basic families. Uh, over the years of racing and keeping what I consider my best birds, I found over time, almost organically, that all my good birds come from three basic families. My original Beckards, my 155 stuff, and my Chris birds. All the race winners, all the good top performing birds seem to come off of those three families. So that's basically what I have left. I do have some odds and ends, and these are the kind of birds that are I consider odds and ends. Now this dark checker here on the left sitting on the bowl is a bird I got from the club president when he decided to not race old birds that year. He was reducing some of his birds. Uh, and I went through him and I found this cockbird here and I asked him where he was. I knew the band number, it was from Chattanooga. So that sort of led me on to think that he was from, in fact, Carl Lay. And he is, in fact, from Carl Lay. Uh, if you guys don't know who Carl Lay was, he was a super racer in his time. He's far retired now. Um, he, in fact, does have the same or did have the same family of Beckards that uh, the original owner of our Beckards. Uh, they shared birds a lot. So I, this bird here could very well be of the same Beckard family that we have. I don't know. So I just, I can't assume that. I can't make that, uh, you know, without having a pedigree, without having that information. But nonetheless, he was a 250 mile winner. And I was happy to get him. I didn't necessarily need extra, but I'm not going to pass up on a winning bird. I don't care really what's in the background. If the bird performed at the level that I wanted, that's what I want to move forward with. Pedigrees, for me, only tell me what's in the background. It doesn't necessarily mean anything. It's like that old saying, pedigrees don't fly, right? Well, either way, guys, we put them onto a daughter of the 155 stuff, and they, in fact, bred me a 400-mile third-place money winner last year 
the big chocolate that I sent Blessings Loft, this in fact is the father to that chocolate. I put him on a daughter. So he was bred onto a daughter of Boy Blue and the chocolate hen, which is a sister to the chocolate hen in the bowl. So you guys see how it works? The birds just sort of start to organically uh, fit my loft depending on how I want to use them. So those two were bred together and they bred at the very last race of the year, the big 400, bred a third place win. I may have done better, I, where I, let me rephrase that. I could have done better had I actually trained the bird that went to the races, but it was so far in the, in the season, um, I simply didn't care. I let the birds do what they wanted for three weeks, absolutely, or virtually no training apart from law flying, and I still sent them and he still did that well. So the cock earned his spot, that's why he's in this loft now instead of the opposing loft. Give me one second, because I got two dummies fighting that don't belong in there. He's going to cause issues. I'm trying to figure out. <sighs> Stay in your box. Oh, sorry about that. Oh, I lost track of thought. Dang it. Oh yeah, so the race, 400 miles. I sent the birds with virtually no training and I still took a third place winning the prize money. I can't really argue with that. I mean, super birds, super performance. My opinion, right? A performance in different places may be much better or much worse. But for me, I consider that super performance when you don't have to train a bird and he still does that well. Moving on, this hen here. <laughs> this is another one of those stories I love to tell guys because in 2020, I won the 300 with a four bird drop. Now, out of those four birds, three were mine and she was not. She trapped. I called the owner right away because I believe in karma. I said, hey, I have your bird. Do you want me to bring it to the club? Do you want me to let it go? How do you want to approach this? He said, well, give her a few minutes. Let her eat and drink. Let her go. She'll be back. And that's what she did. He wanted to finish racing her. She was in the big money race at the end of the season, so he wanted to definitely... You know capitalize on the fact that he paid to put her in the race so i respect that i said okay no problem we let her go she made it back within a few minutes he called me told me she was there but at the end of the year at our big club meeting he brought the hen with him and he gifted her to me now he didn't know at the time that she in fact came on the winning drop she just simply missed the wrong exit or took the wrong exit and missed her own exit so that tells me that the bird had the conditioning that bird had what it took to make that 300 mile flight in super good time because I won minutes ahead she just simply missed the exit and as he handed her to me I then in fact told him that and I can sort of see the look on his face maybe not necessarily regret but maybe something in the nature of I maybe I should have kept her uh, you know how it is we sort of focus on the one race to to develop our birds and for here for us here in Michigan it's the big classic we sort of all breed and aim for that classic the big money race so the fact that she didn't do as well in the classic as she did on the 300 he decided not to keep her which I'm happy happy having her she went on to gingerbread man last season and bred me my first race winner right out the hole right out the gate I mean to say so I mean she's already proven herself as a racer she's proven herself as a breeder this year, I said to myself, I'm going to put these two together. They bred super pigeons. They are the oddballs. They don't necessarily fit my loft, but if they continue to breed, maybe it would be my fourth family, and I'm going to build it off of these two birds here. We'll see. Again, you know, we're taking a chance. He bred a 400-mile third-place winner. She bred a 100-mile first-place winner. Uh, you know, we're going to see. Is it something they have, or is it something that I put them on to? I think a lot of guys make the mistake where they'll buy a very expensive pigeons, for instance, take it home, put it over their very best bird, and when it does breed a winner, they assume that bird was the reason it bred the winner. Not the fact that they, in fact, put it over their very best bird that has proven to breed winners, if that makes sense. I think a lot of guys make the mistake that they associate the price of a pigeon with the quality of a pigeon. So if they spend a thousand dollars on a bird, they're gonna go home and breed it over their very best proven pigeons. And when it does win or does produce a winner, then it's, well, it, it produced a winner. Not the fact that they bred it over their, you know, proven bird already. But we're getting off a rant here, guys. Pair number 11, we're at an eight minute mark already. I don't wanna go any further than that. I think it's a really nice pair. They match 
very nice. Uh, he's the kind of cockbird that I love to see. He is about three years old and he's already got a nice fat waddle on his face. I'm old school guys. I like cockbirds to look like cockbirds and I like henbirds to look like henbirds. I don't like cockbirds that are 10 years old and they look like a hen. Just not me. Pair number 11. 